Very grateful to be here and very excited in front of all you auspicious bodies and all you regular bodies as well. And this is the problem we run to immediately when we talk about Vajrayana and healing because we were told in the West that mainly Vajrayana is about solving the big problems. Who are we? How do we transform ourselves? Enlightenment. And in fact, when I first met Kalo Rinpoche back in 1980, I posed that question to him. I said, Rinpoche, I have these healing abilities and I'm worried. I read somewhere that if you use your CDs in some way, if you don't keep them secret, you're going to lose your powers. Something bad will happen. And he said, no, that's just a karmic layover. If you have those gifts, just use them to help people and all will be well. So he gave me the green light, but then he still threw me into three-year retreat. So there you go. Uh, so Vajrayana is definitely for the ultimate goal of personal transformation, transformation of the self to a new identity, but also in the relative level, it is for the healing of our samsaric worries. So there are various land healing uh, techniques, uh, physical healing techniques for long life, for uh, there's local healers, for example, right in this community here in Timpu like Lama Chuying, who does nothing but house calls to help people with whatever's going wrong in their lives, whether it's their lost livestock or death in the family, etc. So quite apart from Tibet, traditional Tibetan medicine, Buddhist Ayurveda, uh, we have a job to do in Vajrayana healing. And uh, there's a particular parallel uh, phenomenon that happened back in the 60s with an explosion of Dharma into the West with the diaspora from Tibet, and we had a rapid growth and adoption of Tibetan Buddhist practices, the creation of centers in various cities around the uh, American continent and the world and Europe, uh, visits of contemporary masters and translations of great works, and even secret techniques like the six dharmas of Naropa and Tibetan Trokor and so on. All this became very uh, widely available. And of course, always the worry about where's the balance between tradition and innovation with the wild and wacky Westerners. At the same time, paralleling that was an explosion of holistic, alternative, and natural healing methods, yoga, tai chi, which came into the mainstream, the beginning of meditation, mindfulness. And all of these, uh, in the West, there has generally been a development of both on the professional level and the self-help level, as we'll see as we go along. And along with that came the Western concept of research to actually validate these various different practices. So we're going to, in my paper, which, uh, by the way, I'm going to rush through a lot of these slides because I made too many, but if you give me your card, I'll send you a copy of the slides, and of course, you can read my more extensive paper. But I'm focusing on the two core aspects of Vajrayana practice, which are light and sound visualization and mantra, as opposed to the Western st uh, styles of guided imagery and created visualization on the one hand, and sound therapy and music therapy on the other. And there's just some parallels that we can make. I'm going to rush through, I'm going to actually avoid this slide because it would take a long time to go through the pros for Dharma and the pros for alternative medicine, but uh, you can read about it on the slide later on in my paper, just to say that there's a very, very rich ground and opportunity for collaboration and sharing, etc. But I will say something about the cons because spiritual technology is extremely powerful. It's as powerful as pharmaceutical medicine and it can be misused, obviously. And also, even if you're successful, you can have some very unexpected results because it can transform one in ways that you didn't expect. And uh, if it's divorced from its ethical base, its, uh, uh, its uh, uh, base of ethical concern and uh, regard for others, that's a problem. And if it's taken out of its context of a gradual, a gradual progression through time and space and to develop oneself, that's also a problem. And for those people entering into any of these practices, they, they can get rather confused because there is this traditional methodology and then there's a, what Tibetans like to call the tukpa or the soup that Westerners put together by mixing and matching various things. And then there can be what's called the McDonaldization uh, of spiritual methods, which is represented very well here by, for example, the 11 day mantra challenge, discover a happier, healthier you in 11 days, 11 powerful mantras, one incredible transformation or you have mantra meditation for attracting and healing relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So we can really go off the far edge as Westerners. So let's first talk a little bit about sound. And again, I'm just gonna touch a little highlights and the things that have impacted me. The first thing is that physics has shown us very clearly, very vividly that all is connected, all is vibration, all is energy. 
in all religious traditions, whether that's India, uh, ancient Middle East, uh, Christianity, uh, China, uh, ancient Egypt, Tibet, they all said in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the seed syllable. And so it does seem like sound comes before even light in the development of our world. And there's and sound is part of what they call the theory of everything or tr uh, some grand physics theory to explain, mathematical theory to explain what this is all about. One of the latest in that regard is called the Marion Matrix, which you can look up. And if you really want to get in it, into it, you can read these various books on string theory and quantum mechanics and so on as it applies to consciousness. And particularly, this is a nod to Rupert Sheldrake here, who goes to great lengths to show, as other authors have, that neuroscience is only half of the battle. That's like uh, if you want to understand how music is coming out of a radio, you dissect that radio and look at all the different wires and so on. If you don't understand that there also is a plug in the wall, and there's FM and AM radio stations buzzing around, you're not going to understand music through dissecting a radio. So the brain is just an instrument of the mind. They're two very separate and different things, and physics is one way to bridge that gap. Now, what I want to tell you is we've all been deceived. We were all taught as kids that sound are these little wiggles, these little waves that travel through space and reach our ears and so on. That's not what sound is. Sound is spherical. Every word that's coming out of my mouth and every sound you hear arises as a beautiful sound bubble that has these different uh, compression ratios and so on and so forth. It travels at 700 miles an hour out of your mouth. And not only that, as it's traveling at such a speed and it causes friction with the molecules it encounters, it creates infrared light. So though your sound of your voice will decay or some music will decay in moments, the uh, infrared light could travel to infinity. If you yell outside, that might go off into the stars somewhere. Now that has a tremendous impact on our being because every sound we're making is also rippling through our body. This is an art artist's conception of what that sound bubble would look like. And uh, the range of that sound is that that sound is now known to imprint on every cell, on every liquid membrane, you could say, and has many different uh, mind-body effects. It's even been shown now that cells, using yeast cells, have a, they vibrate and they have a detectable language, just as the cosmos itself has a de decipherable language. And here's an example. This is a simograph. In other words, this is a sound picture. If you slice through one of those sound bubbles, which is a holographic sound bubble, you will get these pictures. Every sound bubble, right down to the molecular level, this holographic means it shows these patterns. sounds all mean for us. Here are, is a picture of the musical scale through this science of cymatics of all of the regular do, re, mi, so, fa, si, la, ti, do on a piano, what those mandalas look like. Interestingly, they are, interestingly, they are uh, five part mandalas in large, but there's also 12 part and eight part mandalas. Again, this is, contains information. They're not just pretty pictures. This is how uh, life communicates. In fact, uh, sound and light are the way that cells actually communicate. So I'm just going to rush through this area. Healing music was part of every, every tradition and every culture in the past, ancient China, ancient India, and so on. Modern music therapy uh, became well established in the 1940s in the US. Uh, in this profession, they see over 300,000 patients a year um, in 30 different countries and treats every kind of condition under the sun very favorably, especially those with chronic degenerative neurological diseases, cancer, pain relief, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then on the other side, we said there's a professional side and then there's a self-help side. We have didgeridoo healing, Tibetan gongs that no Tibetan, of course, has ever seen, uh, tuning forks, binaural beats to synchronize brain waves, vocal toning with angels, so everything under the sun falls under the self-help category, whatever you like. But uh, Vajrayana sound is not lagging behind. There's a number of very interesting papers that are arising these days. This is like, like the roar of a thousand thunders, instrumental music and creativity in Tibetan Buddhist ritual and so on. And uh, this book just came out from Nida 
Chat Sanang, the well-known Rep Kong Ngakpa, who travels around the world teaching Tibetan medicine and so on. And this is the first book, it seems, in the Tibetan Zonka language on mantric healing. Uh, it's about a 400-page book, makes some very interesting reading, especially the chapter on the actual, uh, from the traditional perspective, how mantras actually work through tendril. Toning is also very interesting, don't do it right now, but you can do it during the break, of finding the pitch or the tone that works in your body, that heals you. You know, every actor and every singer knows that there's four different resonators in the body. You go, ooh, ah, a, e. So you imagine with your mantra practice to find the ways and places in where it resonates in your body, to aim that mantra at different parts and different pitches and see what really works for you. So this is a way that uh, Dharma can benefit from an alternative form of medicine. At the same time, wouldn't it be nice if toning itself as a practice started using the phraseology and the mantric melodies and so on of Vajrayana? So there's a place for mutual exchange. Now this all works through resonance. Resonance means things are in a vibratory alignment with each other. And there's not only mechanical resonance and electromagnetic resonance, there's quantum resonance, what they call quantum entanglement, emotional and spiritual. This is really how magic happens. Things uh, regulate together and the correct frequency will correct your imbalance frequency in the body. And I put this little graphic up here of the research that's done on a cat's purr. Apparently, apparently cat's purrs have the right frequency so that you can heal everything from stress to particularly broken bones and so on. So in case anyone has any broken bones here, we uh, put this little thing in here. Can you listen? listen? Whoop. Strange things can happen there when you're doing this kind of therapy. So, uh, but you can go online and you can get nine hours of cat purring on YouTube, so you don't, need to, you don't need to rent a cat. And this just shows some of the resonant frequencies in the body that they've discovered in the mechanical parts of the body. So having those different megahertz or hertz frequencies aimed at those parts of the body can promote healing. And one of the ways that sound works also is through psychoneuroimmunology, which is just telling us, science is telling us what we've always known, that the mind does affect the body. The psychological system, the neurological system, and immunological systems are all tied up together. And this is a more further diagram to show some of those connections which are both through peptide proteins as well as the directly through the lymphatic system, hormonal system, and so on. Now, science of mantra, again, I'll just rush through this slide. We know that science, the mantra is to purify us on the speech level, which is the level of the Sambhogakaya, of pure energetics, archetype, and so on. And it's interesting that the Nirmanakaya level, which is the level of form, is about light. So again, we see that sound seems to be on a higher hierarchical level than form or light. Um, the source of mantra is the, is the question here that is uh, at issue, I suppose, with science. Uh, because science might say, and they have s said in many different papers on Dharanis and mantras and so on, that it's just an arbitrary or meaningless series of syllables that we then impute meaning onto. Or, as we Buddhists would say, it comes from a sacred source. The form, the color, the shape, the sound actually provides a portal to uh, higher energies, to higher frequency experiences. And that actually they aren't made up by people, but they are naturally arising. And if you do your mantra practice, they will begin to uh, manifest themselves spontaneously. So this is the, going to be, again, the struggle between science and uh, spirituality. Now, this was an interesting experiment where they had a number of monks chanting Amitabha mantra and the other ones chanting Santa Claus. And of course, the ones chanting Amitabha did a lot better in terms of the relaxation response and so on. But of course, that might just be because they believe in Amitabha and they don't believe in Santa Claus. So, interesting study. Let's talk about light a little bit. You know, we're visualizing every moment, all the time. Every kind of stimulus, somebody says it's almost lunchtime, you're having those pictures in your head. Science calls this involuntary uh, visualization. But when we use problem solving, creative thinking, and so on, this is called voluntary. And so we can use that ability, which I don't think any other creature on the planet has, to intentionally guide our imagery. So medically, they have something called this therapy invention, intervention called guided imagery, which is very, very common now and part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And again, all kinds of treatments 
uh, all kinds of conditions can be treated. And there's hundreds of what they call scripts. There's one little book there that has a hundred uh, guided imagery scripts that you can use, which again are just kind of made up by people. Then we have in the self-help end of things, we have Think and Grow Rich back in the 30s that sold over a hundred million copies, basically visualizing a lot of wealth and it'll come to you. And that goes all the way down to Shakti Gwain, the, the Secret, etc. So there's this whole idea of magical thinking that you can just make anything manifest for yourself. So they went a little bit too far in that direction. Uh, Vajrayana visualization, again, we'll skip through this quickly, but the goal here is transformation of our experience, transforming form and sound, disidentification with our samsaric self and our samsaric experience, and re-identification with a higher level and creation of a light body. And here's the point I really wanted to make, and I'm almost finished, is that biophotonism has now shown us that all cells and the DNA itself emit light, what they call ultra-weak photons or ultra-photonic emission. And this is a major form of communication, not only between neurons, you know, those 40,000 connections that are supposed to be in each neuron, that couldn't possibly be done through chemical means, they'd mix up with each other. But it can be done through the fiber optics of light uh, and also between cells and now this can be accurately measured with implement with a regular instrumentation that me measures photonic fields uh, DNA even stores photons photons are also stimulated in one experiment they showed by red yellow green white and blue I don't know why they picked the colors of the five elements but they did whoops stop um, I said stop cancel there you go uh, this is lying I'm not really finished uh, how do you stop this thing? Oh, there you go. Um, so um, the most interesting part is that imagined light increases for biophotonism. So when you actually think of things, when you imagine things, you are creating light. Those pictures you see in your head, you are creating light within your body. So when you're doing your meditation, it helps to know you can spread real light. And my supposition is that this light that we have in our body is usually this amorphous field of light, but the rainbow body, is a method to using the yidam as our, you could say, template, pour our photonic energy into an actual form and create a rainbow body that does survive the death of the physical body. And uh, so that could be the, the understanding of the rainbow body. Now, I didn't want to leave you with just this information. I wanted to leave you with a real answer to a puzzle that people have been asking for thousands of years is who am I? We're always asking who, 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 who. So finally we have the answer, at least a visual answer of who. Uh, that's some biophotonism. Okay, here's the who answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>